What's up, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV, and uh, I want to give a shout out to Town Biz. Uh, he's the first one I saw in the uh, LDBC to talk about this. Um, there are 13 overall finalists for the uh, Mesa Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in 2019. Um, of the 13, in my opinion, there are definitely five. I mean, it's probably more than that, but there's definitely five in my mind that are likely to get in, and these are the two most likely, in my opinion. Um, the three most likely, excuse me, to get in. Um, Teresa Weatherspoon, I think, is definitely going to get in. Uh, we all most remember her for her play in the WNBA from 1997 to 2004. Um most prominently with the New York Liberty. And then the last couple of years of her career, she played with the LA Sparks. Uh, she went to college, uh, Louisiana Tech, same college that Carl Malone went to. Um, and now she's the coach of the, the uh, female team with Louisiana Tech. And uh, what I remember about her was that she was a, I used to look at her almost like as a female um, Latrell Sprewell back then. <coughs> Except she was more defensive orientated and was a great ball handler. And um, I remember she had one of the greatest shots in the history of w at WNBA. I can't even remember the entire sequence, but someone might probably remember it better than me. But I remember she hit like a a game-winning shot from, like, half court or something like that. I can't remember. Or be, it might have been beyond half court. It might have been, like, 99 or something like that. I, I don't know. But it was a long time ago. But um, she was a two-time defensive player of the year winner with WNBA. She led the WNBA in steals twice. I think uh, she led the WNBA in assists her first year in the WNBA. She's number two all time in uh, the WNBA in total assists. So she's and she was a great college player, and uh, so far she's been a rather successful uh, collegiate coach. So she's definitely going to get into the Hall of Fame. Chris Webber. It's been long overdue for Chris Webber, but I don't have a problem with him not being a first ballot Hall of Famer. I always have been of the opinion that. The Hall of Fame should be for the creme de la creme, the Michael Jordans, the uh, Oak Chamberlains, Abdul Jabbar's, Barclays, and, you know, O'Neal's, Duncan's, and, you know. But I've recognized that the Hall has become now the Hall, it's been slightly diluted. It's more of the Hall of the very good. So I don't have a problem with Chris Webber being. Inducted, and I think this is his third year or fourth year. I think it's his third year. So I don't have a problem with that. Like, I remember that year Reggie didn't get in his first year eligibility, he got in his second year. So I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but I do think that Chris Webber is probably the strongest overall candidate. Okay. Chris Webber played for, uh, I want to say it was 15 years. Yeah, 15 years. Uh, first with the Golden State Warriors, then with the Washington Bullets, then the Sacramento Kings. And I think that's, a, what, maybe 2005 is when he had the injury. And then afterward, he wasn't the same player. And then I remember him having various stints with several teams. I think he played with the Pistons, the Sixers, and I think he finished his career back with the Warriors before he retired, I think. Um... Perennial 20-10 and 10 guy. Statistically, I think his best year was a strike short in the year 98-99. I think he led the NBA in rebounding that year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Chris Webber was definitely one of the best power forwards in the game. All right. Um, for about a decade, you know, he wasn't the best power forward. Usually, earlier on, the best power forward was considered maybe Carl Malone, briefly Barkley, before he started having his injuries. Sean Kemp in the mix. You know, Weber was kind of there. Then when Tim Duncan and Garnett emerged, he was always seen like maybe just below those guys, but still he was always seen as one of the best 
power forwards in the game. And, of course, many of us feel that in 2002, that Sacramento Kings team was cheated out of an NBA championship. Now, there have been many games where you could be biased, you know what I'm saying, as a fan, and you could see certain shit that goes against your team, but the other team, you're not looking at, nah. Nah. Even Laker fans, when you bring it up, uh, if they're being sincere, even though they'll say something like, well, we won it, we won it, but in the back of their mind, they're thinking, yeah, they cheated for us, but hey, we're not going to give y'all that credit, you know. Um, but that Kings team was very good, man. And uh, Chris Rupert was really good for many years. He was a great passing big man, you know what I'm saying? And uh, you have to wonder what could have happened if Chris Webber actually was drafted by the Orlando Magic and he played alongside uh, Shaquille O'Neal. And uh, also, he was a member of the Fab Five of Michigan. Um, it was him, Jalen Rose, Jawan Howard, who, who you know, Jawan Howard, who Chris Webber played with with the Washington uh, Bullets at the time now, Washington Wizards. Um, who else was on that damn team? Jimmy King. I can't think of the other guy's name, man. Jackson. It wasn't Jimmy Jackson. Ron Jackson. Ray Jack. Ray Jackson? Ray Jackson? I think it was Ray Jackson. Ron? Oh, I don't know. But anyway, <clears throat> also that was one of the, the the great teams of all time, Fab Five. All right, so he's definitely going to get in. Ben Wallace. This is a guy who was basically a walk-in. You know what I'm saying? I think he walked in with the Washington... Wizards, I think by the time they were the Wizards, or they might have still been the Bullets, I can't remember, but they were the Wizards. And um, I remember he was on that Orlando Magic team in 99, where Doc, that team that many people didn't think was going to get in the playoffs. I think that's the year Doc Rivers won coach the year. But he really de finally developed when he was with the Detroit Pistons. And for a number of years, he was the premier defensive player in the NBA, all right? He was the defensive anchor for those great Detroit Piston teams in the mid-2000s. Four times, okay, he was defensive player of the year, all right, that which ties the Kim Matumba for the most, all right, in the history of the NBA. And you can make a serious case, a serious case, that Ben Wallace should have won defensive player of the year over uh, the only other candidate that you generally saw at the time, um, Metal World Peace or Ron Artest. The year that Ron Artest won it, you can make the argument that he should have won it that year. Uh, ben Wallace led the NBA in blocks numerous times. I think it was like three times. Let me see something. Just did a video about this comparing him with Kim Tumble. I think it was two or three times led the NBA blocks. Nope. Just once, actually. Led the NBA blocks 2001 2002 season. Led the NBA rebound in 2002 and 2003. 13 rebounds a game, 15.4 rebounds per game. And um, tremendous. Overall defensive player, all, all, no, well, he wasn't a great all-around player. He had his weaknesses. He wasn't much of a scorer, and he was a horrific free throw shooter. I think statistically, he's the worst free throw shooter in the history of the NBA. All right, only forty-one percent. Only forty-one percent. He had numerous seasons where he only shot, where he shot under thirty percent from the foul line. So he he had a lot of holes in his game. Okay. Um, but he's helped by the fact that he had a lot of achievements and, 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 you know, he did help his team. He was big in that series. 
Uh, he did help to contain Shaquille O'Neal. Um, I think it's a myth, though, that he shut Shaq down. People got you know, think about the fact that that team played more outside in rather than inside out from the Lakers. But he did help to contain Shaq, especially in certain late game situations, and helped his team to win an NBA championship in 2004, one of the greatest finals upsets of all time. I think it's the greatest final upset. Some people always talk about, well, well Cleveland came back from 3-1, yeah, but, you know, no, mo most people didn't give that team any shot at beating that Laker team. You know what I mean? And um, four-time NBA All-Star, three-time All-NBA second team, um, He's the all-time leader in Detroit Pistons and blocks. And his number, of course, was recently retired by the Detroit Pistons. All right, so that's those three guys. And there's two other people who I think are going to get into the Hall of Fame. One of them, that, uh, one of those candidates is Bill Fitch, man. And I think on the surface, if you look at Bill Fitch's record, I think it's 944 wins. 1,106 losses. And you're thinking, like, oh, man, this guy was a mediocre coach. Um, but that's why you have to always look and analyze things deeper before you make, you come to a uh, conclusion which could be erroneous. Bill Fitch was actually one of the greatest coaches in the history of the NBA. Um, in 1996, he was considered uh, one of the 10 greatest coaches of all time. And on that list, He's the only coach currently who's not a Hall of Famer. And the reason why his record is not that great statistically is because he was often uh, selected to turn around failing teams. Um, when he was hired to coach the Cleveland Cavaliers in the early 1970s, they were one of the worst teams in the NBA. I think their first year they only won 15 games. He eventually turned that team around to win 49 games, I think it was the 75-76 season, somewhere along that lines. They won 49 games, went to the playoffs, and I think they made a pretty good playoff run that year. Don't remember what round they were eliminated in, but it's still referred to as the miracle of Richfield. And he was hired in 1979, or might have been 78. One of those two years, I think it was 79, though, to coach the Boston Celtics. At that time, the Boston Celtics were in a tailspin. They'd only won 29 games the year before. I think it was in 79 when he was hired. And, of course, Boston made one of the greatest turnarounds in the history of the NBA. Went from 29 to 61 wins. And in 81, Bill Fitch won his one and only NBA championship. And Larry Bird credited Bill Fitch for instilling in him his strong work ethic. All right. Um, Bill Fitch was hired by the Houston Rockets in the early 1980s to be their head coach. And, of course, ultimately the Houston Rockets became one of the stronger teams in the Western Conference, uh, ultimately making an NBA final appearance in 1986. And then he was hired to try to turn around the New Jersey, at the time the New Jersey Nets, who were a horrible team. And he had mixed success with that. Um, but all in all, he's always been a guy who was kind of like Larry Brown in the sense that he was a great X's and O's guy. And he could you know, uh, adjust, make, you know, make adjustments and work with what he had and get the best out of the teams that he, you know, the players that he had. He was a maximum, he, he, he created maximum results out of moderate to even minimum uh, talent. And that's what made him such a great coach. And that's why his record is misleading. And I do think that he needs to be in the Hall of Fame. And also, <clears throat> I don't want to be sound morbid, but Despite this picture here was from the 1970s when he was in his 40s, Bill Fitch is 86 years old. And you, and you kind of want to 
guy who's in the twilight of his career to see uh, that honor of becoming a Hall of Fame uh, inductee. And I mean, it's long overdue for Bill Fitch. And the last person I think is definitely going to get into the Hall of Fame, Sidney Moncrief. Sidney Moncrief played the majority of his career with the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, finished his career, I think it was the 90-91 season with Atlanta Hawks. Uh, Sidney Moncrief was, I'd say, the first half of the 1980s was the premier shooting guard. I think I'll just before I say this. I think he probably possibly was the premier shooting guard in the NBA. Um, George Griffin was the greatest scorer, but all around, I mean, the, of that period, but all around, two-way, uh, Sidney Moncrief was the best shooting guard in the NBA. And um, he could score. Um, for four consecutive years, he averaged over 20 points per game for his career. He averaged nearly 16 points per game. Um, but he was known for his tenacious defense. And uh, he led, uh, excuse me, he was the the winner of the first two Defensive Player of the Year awards in 82-83 and I think 83-84. And um, he was the leader of those Milwaukee Bucks teams that I've said time and time again that I think they were the best team in the NBA um, not to make it to the NBA Finals. And it's interesting, I've been saying that in videos a lot, right? I've been saying that a lot. And I saw <clears throat> on Wikipedia, now Wikipedia you can't really trust all the time with information, but a lot, you know, for the most part, majority of the times it's pretty accurate. Now I saw something added. They said that the Bucks had the best winning percentage in the nineteen eighties outside the Lakers and the Celtics. I never saw that before. And they said uh, the Bucks were one of the best teams in the in the nineteen eighties. But their only problem was they can never make it to the NBA Finals and Monk was never there. I never saw that before. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I've been saying it for years, right? Whatever. So it's Sidney Moncrief, multiple Hall of Famer, uh, excuse me, multiple All-Star, he's going to get in. It's a couple of guys I'm not certain that they're going to get in. It's a couple of them I'm not certain of. I'm not certain if Marquise Johnson is going to get in. Man. I think he probably should. Um, before Sidney Moncrief joined the Milwaukee Bucks, he was the undisputed best player on that team. His selection in 1977, okay, in the draft by the Bucks, along with, I think that's the same year that George Call was hired to be the head coach. Not George Call, excuse me. Don Nelson was hired to be the head coach of that team. He saw a turnaround um, eventually with that Bucks team in the post Crim Dual Jabbar era. And up until the neck injury in 87. Marquise Johnson was always one of the better small forwards in the game. But I don't know if there was ever a period you could say he was like the top two or three. You know, it's hard. Um, I think his second year in the NBA, I just looked this up, okay. I think he was third in scoring behind George Gervin and World Be Free. All right. I think he was still Lloyd be free at the time. But there were many years where he wasn't even the best player on his own team. Um, he did win a championship in college with UCLA. He averaged 20 points per game for his career. Some people consider him the first true point forward in the NBA. He got a, he's got a real good shot, man. The, the only thing that I wonder about that. Okay, this is the reason why I'm wondering if he's going to get in this year. Him, okay, and then you have Jack Sigma. Now, Sigma, considering the era, man, he wasn't as dominant as, obviously, he wasn't as dominant as Abdul Jabbar, Malone, um, Patrick Ewing, 
you know, he, he wasn't dominant like those guys, but he was a standout center, um, more grounded, you know what I'm saying? Uh, no more for his more polished, I guess, post-game, wasn't flashy, um, but solid, uh, had a great jumper, great step back jump shot. Um, was no more for his. Um, was no more for being a good, a great shooter. Uh, in particular, in his Milwaukee Bucks years, he got his range out to three point range and became a actually a very good outside shooter. And interestingly enough, if Jack Sigma played today, he would be valued more. He would be a stretch five or four. And uh, he led the NBA defensive rebounds twice. Um, <clears throat> I think he's the only center to lead the NBA in free throw percentage. I can't think of another center who's done that. One year he led the NBA in free throws with 92% accuracy. He became a better foul shooter uh, as his career progressed. And, um, of course, he won an NBA championship in 1979 with the Seattle Supersonics. And um, he never averaged 20 points per game, but he always, almost always averaged a, a double-double. And um, But then again, you can make the argument that he played on teams with a lot of different, you know, scorers on the team. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he played on a team that had... Uh, Dennis Johnson and, and Paul Silas, Gus Williams, downtown Freddie Brown. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that team was like, went 52 and 30 that year, if I'm not mistaken, won the NBA championship in 79. And they went to the finals the year before that, losing in seven games, I think, to the Washington Bullets, then the Washington Bullets. Uh, so, like I said, Jack Sigma has a case, but one of the reasons why I'm wondering if they're going to get in this year, there's a lot of former Milwaukee Bucks to get in in one year, man. You know, I just wonder how much politics and maneuvering plays in these selections. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I would like for all these guys to get in, um, but I don't know if all of them are going to get in. And the only knock that I have on Sigma is I can never say that I don't even know if you could say he was the best player on any team that he played on. You know, um, mm. but he played a long time. He was a seven time all-star. So, with the way that the Hall of Fame is now, yeah, you, you probably would. He probably would get in eventually. I'm just not sure if it's this year. But tell me what you guys think, man.